Okay, hey guys, so um, in the last lecture, we talked about how do we value discount, pure discount bonds, which are these bonds, fixed income securities, they actually pay off only one time. So we call it either as a single payment bond or a zero coupon bond or a street. So today, we're moving on to the second bond we want to discuss um, in this course, Finance Theory um, 2020 summer, which is coupon bonds. So to, um, after we discuss discuss discount bond, coupon bond should be straightforward, but it is way more complex than what been we've been discussing on um, discount pure discount bonds. And we actually try to evaluate it. and today, by the end of today's lecture, you should be able to understand what is law of one price. And I'm actually going to introduce way more than what the slides are talking about because I want you guys to understand arbitrage. So today definitely we will be understanding and I will be teaching you what is a coupon bond and the method um, that people, different economists think are the best in pricing coupon bonds. But I'm also going to introduce this concept called arbitrage and how, how to take advantage of arbitrage in a market because arbitrage is a way the finances people who are doing financial transactions actually make money in the market saying like investment bank like JP Morgan Chase, Bank of America, these people actually make money with arbitrage as well, playing which plays actually a pretty important role. So when we talk about coupon bonds, um, what should be in your mind, primarily it is actually a discount bond but pays coupons. Basically means it is not a single payment bond rather than we have different coupons paying at different periods of time. For instance, if I ask you, I, uh, there's a bond with a face value of $1,000 and the coupon over three years paying 5%, what will we get? So basically that means each year you'll get actually 5% of $1,000, which is $50. You'll get it for two years and at the end of third year, you'll get $50 plus the face value. So in the end, you'll get 1150. So that's how a coupon bond should be defined in a nutshell. And if you look at this graph here, it talks about the time series of US Treasury security yields. You can actually see this interesting thing that with this valuation of coupon bonds, that you can see coupon bonds valuation, especially when it's longer. For instance, you see 30 years, 20 years, different bonds in different times actually have significant different yields. Um, in the market, it's a little bit laggy. You can see actually see that the treasury security yields of the US actually do differ. You know, depends on time, they do differ a lot. And looking at this graph right here, you can see coupon bonds do have different yields. So maturity here, um, it isn't confusing. It basically means the time when um, it just means the time basically when um, the stock re um, the bond actually redeems, issuer redeems certain coupons, and you can see there are many many bonds for two thousand to two thousand four. If you can try identify a trend, there you can see that the valuation of bond actually is getting more complex and complex compared to before. And actually, I want to answer the question: What does this graph tell you? That you can actually see this trend that. You see in 2000 and 2004, there's a difference that in 2004, in 2000, it's much more stable and you are actually, the yield is at a higher price overall. There is a stable high price mean. Well, in, in 2004, you can see it, there is a slope, larger slope, and you can see the yield is rising um, with the rise of the maturity. But an interesting fact that you may have seen is not only it is rising, but it is generally lower than the yield here. Actually, what does it mean is when there is a lower price, it basically gives you a definition. Lower price basically means a higher yield. And now I'm introducing you this relationship that is pretty interesting that to you. There is a pretty interesting relationship. The relationship states that when the yield is higher, the price goes down. When the yield is lower, the price goes up. This graph then means since 2004, we can see there's a drastic slope. Um, you know, um, average price is lower than that of 2000, 2000, which means actually the yield is higher, but also means there's more uncertainty. As we can see, this line is more flatter than this line right here, 2000 compared to 2004. And I'm going to get to the rating part in the next lecture, which we all know we have three major companies. Uh, which are S&P, 
Fitch and um, Moody's, and they are these credit agencies that actually raise the bonds. And usually, a bond that is like this, which means uh, which is a bond that has a average price that is considered to be high, is usually a triple A rated bond. So it is a AAA rated bond. And what happens to this bond is this bond usually have lower price and higher yield. Sorry, it has lower yield and higher price. So this way it means the bond is more stable. If you invest, you are confirmed going to get this six percent yield. Um, and moreover, you have less risk. So it can be if it's a T bill, you can consider that as a risk a riskless T bill. And moreover, for bonds like this, there are higher risk. But sometimes you can go up higher than this, which means there is a potential that you can earn more money. But you have to put into more risk. You have to bear more risk, and they're going to provide you with more return because only more return can attract you to make this investment into this coupon bond since it is highly risky. You can make significant losses compared to this trend of compared to this bond in the 2000, but you can also make you may be also be able to make more gains compared to this bond in 2000 as well. So, how do we value coupon bonds? So now the valuation of coupon bonds is more complex than the discount bond, and there's no answer to that actually. So today I'm going to briefly go through the three of the most famous, actually the most famous hypotheses. And now in the market today, there are only hypotheses, but there's not there's no significant or the only definition or the only uh, way to model this coupon bond and value the coupon bond in the world today. For the discount bond, since there's only one return, it is much easier to value it based on the interest rate. But for the coupon bond, since it is a folding coupon, it is pretty hard to predict whether people will rise the percentage by how much, rise the interest rate, rise the yield by how much, it is hard to predict. They will lower, whether they will lower the yield or uh, leverage the yield, it is a debatable question. So the expectations hypothesis is actually developed by the very own MIT Sloan's professor uh, Cox and Stephen Rose. So John Cox and Stephen Rose actually founded this expo expectations hypothesis, and they hold this opinion right here that they believe the expected future spot will be equal to the current rate. So they think that sorry, the expected future spot rate will be equal to the current fall rate, which means they believe that no matter what time is it, how many years later. The current the, the expected future rate will still be equal to the current reward, which you can see by this little formula right here. However, the liquidity preference holds a completely different opinion, which says that they believe that, that they believe the following. They believe the following that the longer the term of a borrowing of the bond, the longer the term the borrowing of the bond, the more you have to pay. Because that entails the borrower have to give up more money. Let me repeat again. So the liquidity preference states that the longer the term of borrowing, the more you have to pay the bond issuer. This is because the longer term of borrowing entails the issuer have to give up more money. So this seems also making sense for many people that if I borrow you more money, you I think I have to increase the interest rate because that means I have actually more opportunity cost for not to be able to spend this money in the particular period of time when I borrow this bond to you. And a third explanation goes the following, which is the preferred habitat. That says there are preferred maturities at different times. And the world and, and uh, sorry and interest rate will be different at those times. Let me repeat again. There are preferred maturities at different times and the interest rate will be different at those times. So um, this three hypothesis developed by famous professors, Vasek Sack, um, John Cox, and Stephen Rose, which are MIT's finance professors, and he is a general motto, and neither of them work as a single variable because otherwise, if one of these three variable or three hypotheses actually work, that actually means today this professor and people who apply this hypothesis will be able to make perfect forecast. And I don't think it will eventually work. One of them will eventually work because the market in terms of coupon bond is highly complex. Different people hold different opinions. Different people, different parties have different ways of altering the interest rate based on their age, based on their preferences, based on their diversification, based on their financial decisions, based on the situation they are in, and also based on the time when you make this forecasting. 
in the financial crisis of 2008, when you're trying to make a forecast of the interest rate, will be significantly different from the, from the forecast you make in 2020 because, you know, when the financial crisis comes, maybe they lower the interest rate because other, um, they just want people to put some money into their loans to buy their bank. So it really depends on the time. So therefore, the market is highly variable for the coupon bonds. So we can't really assure that either of three or either of these three most prominent and most recognized hypotheses is going to be the sole hypothesis that will work and cover all different uh, investment of coupon bonds. So, and here's the liquidity preference model. If we want to evaluate a little bit more, is that well, the hypothesis, expectation hypothesis, puts an equal sign between expected future spot rate and current forward, which I think you can recall from the last, last lecture, if I want to recall again, that the future spot rate is the interest rate between t and t minus 1, and the current forward rate is the expected rate between, expected interest rate between t minus 1 and t, and it is today's best guess. So they believe whatever we've been forecasting from today to the future will be equal to the future spot rate and will not be changed. Remember, we actually went through future spot rate, current forward rate, and future rate in our last last lecture. And for the liquidity preference model, this thing that the future long-term borrowing requires a premium, which means if you borrow for long-term, you have a premium, which means you have to pay more to the borrower. You have to add a little bit, let add a little bit value to this loan when you actually uh, borrow the loan for a longer amount of time. So they finalize this formula that states as follows: the expected future spot rate is lesser than the current forward. So they believe that the current forward rate is larger. That means the current present value of the future between t, uh, the current present value of the interest rate between t plus, between t and t minus one is actually larger than expected future spot rate um, in the, that will be stated in the future, and that will equal to the um, the current forward rate t minus one to t minus the liquidity premium of the expected future spot rate. So that's how they think. Okay, so these are two of the most prominent models. And the third model, basically, they think it really depends. So this third model, basically, is pretty vague. And what is mentioned it is it really depends on what the time is. And de depending on the time, depending on the person, depending on the market, they are preferred maturities at different times. And interest rate will be different at those times of preferred maturities. So some, so they, they, so the, the folks that actually invented and proposed this preferred habitat theory believe that n neither all people hold this theory that the expected future spot rate will be equal to the current forward spot rate uh, precisely. And they also don't hold this opinion that people in the long term will have the tendency to want a thing called this liquidity premium. They believe some people want, some people even think um, three years maturity is a bad. Some people may want more in the future, some people may want less in the future, it really depends. And now we want to get to the valuation of coupon bonds, which I hope, uh, I think should be pretty straightforward, but it can be highly difficult, uh, is that now I want you guys to think we are going to value coupon bonds in a way that we think of the coupon bonds as a continuous pure discount bonds. So remember we mentioned that the theory is, the theory is, the all coupon bonds are the portfolios of pure discount bonds because when we have a pure discount bond, the coupon bond basically have pays more coupons, pays coupon rather than not paying coupons compared to a pure discount bond, and they pay more at different dates, different maturities. So, for instance, looking at the, so valuation of discount bonds implies valuation of coupon bonds. What is a proof is shown in the following timeline that the first, for instance, for example, is a three-year 5% bond is equal to the sum of the following discount bonds, which can be equal to a 51-year strips, which is a one-year pure discount bond, or 52-year strips, or 10, or 1,053-year strips. Why does it work? And we're going to explain it on arbitrage, which is actually the main player of today's lecture, to, to let you guys understand the financial transactions advantage called arbitrage that you guys can take advantage of especially with modern technology like Excel and, and your computational, like MATLAB computational technologies. And if you think, if you look at this diagram right here, we have a 51 year strips, and here's the 52 year strips, and here's the southern 53 year strip. Why, why can we so sure, why are we so assured when I'm talking to you that it must be equal to the sum of the following? When we are, when we are equalizing 
our coupon bonds, our friend, in this lecture to our pure discount bond. Why I'm so sure about this equalization? Why I'm so sure about this equality? So I'm going to show you here something called the arbitrage. So you guys take a rest from reading this slide right here, because it won't make sense right now if I, if I, uh, re if you guys just read all the slide, um, read these formulas right here. And now I'm going to introduce something that is not from the slide called law of one price. So the law of one price thinks that if there are two identical goods sold in different locations, assuming that there is free market competition, there is no trade frictions, and there's no there's no trade friction, there's free market competition, and there's free pricing. So under these three assumptions, or if I want to be more precise, under these three assumptions, where there's assuming that there's free market competition, there's price flexibility, there's no trade friction. So we have three assumptions right here. Let me repeat again. Free market competition, price flexibility, and no trade frictions. Under these three assumptions, if we have two identical assets, this only applies mainly to financial world, not really to the business, you know, the product you buy Coca-Cola, this kind of biscuit world. But under these three assumptions in the financial market, if there are two assets that are identical, then are sold in different locations, they must be sold in the same price when we express them into the same currency. So this is law of one price. So you might be pretty confused. Why do you have to sell them in the same currency? Can, uh, sorry, uh, you might be confused. Why do you have to sell them at the same price? Isn't lowering the price better? Because lowering the price may mean, oh, um, maybe, maybe if I have two biscuits right here, I have a real biscuit, I have another biscuit. If I lower the price, isn't, isn't I'm trying to have competitive pricing that you guys learn in marketing under this marketing fox in your lecture class? Yeah, you're making a good point. That is why the law of one price, in my opinion, or not in my opinion, I mean in large assumption, actually applies only to the financial world. Because if you say, find the calculator, if someone prices at $20 and I price it at $15, maybe I'm making a profit in the long run because then people will buy, or my calculator, more people will buy, so price elasticity of demand, when you lower the price, larger population going to buy your product. That's why this arbitrage thingy I'm discussing to you and this whole thing about coupon bonds investment and the whole thing about talking about the cost to perform, I mean the whole thing about law of one price applies to the financial market. So. Now I want to give you an example and why law of one price, if, why when we violate law of one price we'll have arbitrage. So before I start off with this example, I want to define what is arbitrage. So now you can read this, now you can read the slide, the last bullet point of the slide, arbitrage basically means there's no risk and there's positive profits, which means you are taking a certain advantage that you buy something on the side and you sell something off the other side and you are making a profit, positive profit, well, you are taking no risk at all. This is an arbitrage. So you're earning money but taking no risk. This is something called the free lunch, technically. This is something called a free lunch. As I said, actually, there's technically no free lunch in this world. There's technically no systematic free lunch in this world. But in financial market, since it is highly complex involving this techni technical work to do, um, therefore, sometimes the assets can be wrongly priced. And when the assets are wrongly priced, some people like this high-speed financial transaction people, they are taking this advantage of arbitrage to buy an asset on one side, sell the asset on the other side, and they are making this positive profit without taking any risk, and this is called taking an arbitrage. So, um, ignore the slide, let me give you an example. And first, under, after this three assumptions of free market competition, price flexibility, no trade frictions, there is something else that have to be an assumption is human must, the population or just a single person must prefer more money to less money. So this is actually the fundamental uh, assumption that humans, if you want to take advantage of arbitrage, you have to have this uh, principle, you have to abide and follow this principle that you prefer more money than less money. Quite a silly question, right? If you do not prefer this, there are, two, there are one reason only that you are a knucklehead, right? Therefore, when you prefer more money to less money, you're going to be able to um, be able to take advantage of this arbitrage. Okay, let me start my example. Imagine there are two exchanges. 
So here is the New York Stock Exchange, and here is London Stock Exchange. If the New York Stock Exchange sells identical asset, let's say identical coupon bond, identical coupon bond at a cheaper price compared to the London Exchange. This is why I'm answering this question right here. Why must these two equal when we under when we finish this calculation? So finance finance calculation of bond bond is actually pretty fixed. You have to equal that, otherwise someone will take the opportunity of the arbitrage. So yeah, continue with my example. The New York Stock Exchange is charging the same coupon bond a lower price than the London Stock Exchange. So what I'm going to do is, as a trader, I'm going to buy the asset from the New York Stock Exchange. I buy the asset from the New York Stock Exchange. I'm going to sell the asset to the London Stock Exchange. And I'm done. So then I'm making a positive profit because I'm assuming because since I mentioned that the price of the New York Stock Exchange of the identical coupon bond or any other financial instrument, financial asset, is sold at a cheaper price. So I'm going to buy this and sell this. In the end, it is basically canceled out. There's no risk involved and I made the benefit, I made a profit, positive profit, which is the difference between the price of New York and price of London. That is, that is an evidence that I'm actually taking an arbitrage. So do you arbitrage? So I'm answering a pretty confusing question. Can this occur? Because I'm taking the abstract. Yes, it is possible. It occurred. Arbitrage, people do take advantage of arbitrage or banks and these intermediaries, these financial players do have arbitrage, not because they want to price it lower, not because New York want to price it um, lower than London. It's because when there are so many bonds in the market get traded, sometimes they make trading mistake in the mathematics where going on. So sometimes people, these financial traders in these intermediaries, in these investment banks, in these brokerage firms, they are taking advantage of this wrong. They are taking advantage of the mistakes made by these firms, made by the stock exchanges. So they are taking this arbitrage, are taking this advantage of an arbitrage. Arbitrage is a result of some financial assets or bonds not correctly priced, because there's so many bonds in the market, and sometimes we follow the same equation. They have to work, but sometimes we, we, we are not able to manage like hundreds of simultaneous equations correctly, and as a result, some, pro, some, some assets can be wrongly priced. I'm also going to give you another example that is in MIT. Another interesting example is that in the 1980s, there were a bunch of MIT graduate students who were hired by Salomon Brothers. And when they enter Salomon Brothers, which is a defunct investment bank, yeah, uh, in the in, hey, how? Yeah. Huh? In the last century, in the last century, Solomon Brothers were actually applying this particular statistics. Actually, they hired these three MIT students from the night um in nineteen eighties, and at that time, there's no PC for the investment bank. There's no Microsoft Excel, and as a result, the students have to solve simultaneous equations in order to find, in order to actually make sure, uh, in order to take advantage of assets that are wrongly priced. So as a consequence, actually, in the end, they found out there are so many simultaneous equations without solutions. So that means some, some bonds are actually wrongly priced. And then the firm, the investment bank, started to take the advantage of arbitrage opportunities. And arbitrage opportunities then means what it comes out is Solomon Brothers actually then paid $22 million bonuses to one of these MIT graduate, because just imagine how much benefits has it generated. So in the past, I think there it is pretty it is harder than today to identify arbitrage opportunities, but it is also easier compared to today to make mistakes on pricing. So if you ask me whether in the past in the 1970s, 1980s, or today in the 2020s, which you mean if you want to question me, question me that which period actually has a higher chance of getting these arbitrage opportunities. I would say it really. I I would say it's nearly equal, but a little bit more in the past because now we have Excel. In the past, they tend to make more mistakes because when they price asset, they have to do manual calculations rather than using Excel, using a PC program. But today, but today, yeah, PC program, but they make more mistakes. But so so coming to today, they do make more mistakes. But since today we are able to have Microsoft Excel, we tend to be able to identify arbitrage opportunities more. But in the past, like what the MIT students were doing, it is harder for them to identify 
they have to actually write manually hours and hours, spending days and days, night and night, in order to figure out whether one of these bonds, one asset is wrongly priced. I'm going to link back to this example later on when we start discussing about simultaneous equations. So, that was about arbitrage. When you buy an asset and sell an asset, identical goods, but when you have both of them at different prices, you are able to gain a positive profit without taking any risk, so you're taking this arbitrage. So next time, when you, when you see and when you find out there are two different identical goods in the financial market at different prices, you should tell nobody, but tell me first, and I'm going to take this advantage. Okay, now you can look back at this formulas right here that the example when we continue on the passage price of three year coupon bond must equal the cost of the portfolio why is that so this is the equation that we must have if it does if it if it's not if it if it doesn't formulate if this formula is formulated and suppose we get something like this which means the price price of three year bond is larger than the cost of this portfolio then we can actually you know, take this advantage of arbitrage. We can buy, we can, since it's larger price, we can buy the um, right-hand side, sell it at the left-hand side, and make this profit. So that is about arbitrage. And now I'm going to talk about multiple coupon bonds as an important topic. So now you guys know about what does arbitrage mean. And imagine, now I want to ask you a question, because now when we solve, for multiple coupon bonds, suppose n is larger than t, the season is already determined, t unknowns and linear equations. And now we have to imagine a situation that you have to solve 30 unknowns in 200 simultaneous equations. So you have 200 simultaneous equations and 30 unknowns. It's pretty hard to solve, isn't it? I want to question you first, make it simple, get a little bit high school math right now. When you have two equations, and two unknowns, how many solutions are we going to get? You're going to get one solution. And when you have two unknowns and one equation, you are going to get how, how many solutions? Infinite solutions. Because you, for instance, 2x plus 3y equal to 8, you're going to get infinite amount of solutions. And if you have three equations and two unknowns, how many solutions do you have? You have either one or zero solution. We will have either one or zero solution because if we have one solution, that will mean that, that if we have one solution, you, that will assume that if the solution of two equations will be able to successfully apply to the third solution. Imagine we have third equation, sorry. If we have three equations and two unknowns, in the end, in the end we got one solution, that will mean that the solution of the two equations must be applied to third equation. If the solution of the two equations does not apply to the third equation, then this three equations and two unknown whole thing will have zero solution. And if you have zero solution, you have to be happy because that means there must be something wrong in the pricing. That would mean the price does not satisfy the relationship between these two yields. And that would be an evidence of a possible arbitrage because that would mean the pricing is wrong for these three particular bonds, for these yields. So that means we are actually taking a free lunch. But that is a simple example when we are thinking of there are three equations, there are two unknowns, we're thinking of this. And, th and we can solve it without even using the Excel, but we can just solve it paper and pen, high school, high school math student to find, figure out whether the third solution will be, will, be, or will be applicable and whether there will be one solution or there will be zero solution. But in investment banking, in the financial market, we are not playing around with only three equations and two unknowns. We are playing around with many solutions, like 200 solutions and 30 unknowns. So, hope you guys understood this point that I made on the three equations and two unknowns thing that when you in finance, which differ from the or the mathematics you learn from your math major Fox right now, right here is that right in the next door is what happens is when you are solving a simultaneous equation and you find out there is zero solution, that means you have to get excited because rather than getting depressed in your high school math class when you can't find out the solution for the simultaneous equation, 
In finance, no solution indicates there is a transaction, which is a linear combination of the first two bonds and the third that cost no money down, you will generate cash flow today and wouldn't require any future risk payout. Let me repeat again. So if you, in finance, solving the simultaneous equation, found out there is no solution to a set of simultaneous equation, then you will have, then it means, it indicates there is a transaction, there's a linear combination of the first two bonds and the third that A, B, C, A, cost no money down, B, will generate cash flow today, C, require no future risk payout. So we are getting an arbitrage, we're getting a free lunch from this zero solution problem set. And I want to ask you guys another question is that when you are think, taking an arbitrage, is there any personal commitment of any of your assets? Is there any personal commitment of your cash? Any personal commitment of your asset? What's your answer? The answer is absolutely no, because what you bought, what you bought in the New York, what you bought in lunch, what you bought in New York market is financed by the London market. So when you have two identity goods, one is cheaper, one is more expensive, what you bought from the cheaper one, even though you're spending your cash to buy this, actually this is financed by the most expensive one. So in situation of an arbitrage, you don't have any, not even a cent, you have zero personal commitment of asset. You have zero commitment of personal asset when you buy and take advantage of an arbitrage. Okay, so now I hope you guys really understand that. And now moving on to more complex because I mentioned that when we are doing multiple coupon bonds, it isn't three, it isn't two. It will be something like 200 coupon bonds, as I mentioned. We will have 200 equations and 30 unknown variables to be solved in this simultaneous equation set. And then we have, have a pretty complex polynomial, have a pretty complex uh, set of simultaneous equations then. And what happens if the solution doesn't exist? Then we got the answer. So in a system, is suppose we suppose n is larger than t, more bounds and more three days, we will have t unknowns and n linear equations, and there will be a pretty tough question to solve. So now, telling back, uh, um, recalling back to the story on the MIT students, when the MIT student graduate was hired at Solomon Brothers, the investment banking firm, the students were required to calculate the t unknowns the T was 30 and N was over 200. So they were manually calculating 30 unknowns from 200 linear equations to find out whether there is whether there is no solution. And they found out there are in, in fact many no solutions right here. And in the end, as I mentioned just now, one graduate of MIT got a $22 million bonuses. You always oh, crazy, right? Just a graduate working at the firm for like one month, a few months, got a $22 million bonuses and that was 1980s, that would equal to what now only the top 100 richest people would make in the world actually. So $22 million in the past equal nearly a billion dollars today, or something like hundreds, hundreds of million dollars. That is, that is what most people can't even make over their whole life, even in the investment banking industry. So, you know, the power of arbitrage is pretty, good, pretty high. Imagine if Solomon Brothers paid the MIT graduate $22 million that will entail that that will actually elude, elude that and the student generate way more value than $22 million for Solomon Brothers when he was solving these simultaneous equations and found out there are so many no solutions. So that is the power of arbitrage because when you identify certain arbitrage, then afterwards as a consequence this investment banking firm, this financial services firm can take large and huge advantages not only like a dollar but since they have a heavy trading portfolio, they will be able to take a huge advantage from this arbitrage to earn a lot of profits without taking any risk. Who doesn't want that? So the Solomon brother was able to take arbitrage this advantage and taking zero risk. So that was the powerful power of arbitrage. Okay, so we finished discussing about coupon bonds. Now we want to start with measures of interest rate risk. How do we measure the interest rate risk? A uh, risk, and I'm introducing you some mathematical concept that you don't have to memorize today, but you can definitely look back later. Is that as the interest rate change, the bond prices also change. So what I'm um, so what I'm introducing you is 
the sensitivity of prices to change the prices goes up so that is how it works that is how the financial market actually work because when there's a higher interest rate the prices usually go down when when the interest rate is because they have because a lower in uh, let me explain it in the concise way the higher the yield means the more risk is the asset because they have to pay more money to you for you to bear the risk that will also mean the lower the price because that means the credit of it as i mentioned rated by moody's you know as a p and feed wouldn't likely to be high right and let, let's move on to Macaulay duration um, which is a theory um, proposed by Canadian economics of the 20th century, Frederick Macaulay. And Macaulay said this complex thing that sensitivity to bond prices, there's the sensitivity of bond prices to yield changes. So what he was thinking is the longer the maturity of the bond, the more sensitive is the bond price to the yield. So this is a theory that actually has been formulated and well widely recognized. Let me repeat again. The longer the maturity of a bond, the more sensitive is the bond price to the yield, which means the longer the maturity, the longer time the bond is going to be going to issue coupons, the more sensitive is a bond price to the yield. So let me see what do I mean by that. So before we get to the final example, let me let me clarify with you something called the duration. Let me ask you the question. When the duration is shorter, will the sensitivity of brown prices to yield changes be larger or smaller? The answer is smaller. Let me ask you another question. When, when the duration of a bond is longer, which means the, long, the maturity of a bond is longer, will the sensitivity of the bond price to the yield be higher or lower? The answer is higher because by giving an intuitive explanation to you, when someone, imagine you are an investor, you are investing a, in a particular bond and it's going to go longer, there, we have to raise the discount rate to a higher exponent. Because when we think about a, a, a longer bond, a bond with longer duration and longer maturity, the net present value is going to decrease. Therefore, the investors are more sensitive to the interest rate than people buying this short mature these bonds with short maturities the opportunity cost is going to be larger as well because if the interest rate doesn't raise so much and uh and the discount rate is going to be larger and larger which means value in the future like 10 years 20 years will be definitely worth much less than the value today there will be high much more higher opportunity cost so that is why the longer the maturity of a bond you will be the more sensitive the bond price to the yield right Okay, now let's go to, um, now actually we finish all the concept and the tough parts today explaining to you. And the measures of interest rate risk, let's use this example right here. Consider a four-year T-note with a face value of $100, certain percent coupon selling at $1.3, we try to uh, yield in the 6%. Now we try to measure the interest rate risk. I'm taking some notes from this um, PS is that for T-notes, coupons are paid actually semi-annually every six months so we're using six month intervals, therefore we're div dividing this original coupon rate by two, which then become 3.5%, and the yield we're dividing it from 6% to 3%. And in this example, you can see the calculus right here. The duration is how do we calculate duration? It is basically, duration is calculated in this way. Okay, let me explain the table to you first. So in the first column of the table, you're seeing the years, one to eight, and the second is actually the cash flow. As I mentioned, it yields a 0.5%, so the cash flow is 0.5%. And then we are calculating in the third column is, we're calculating is the present value of the cash flow. So we're deducting, remember the time value of money, take account of inflation, impatience. And then we get a third part is when we times the year to use the present value cash flow. So it becomes something like this, as you can see clearly in this table right now. And when we try to calculate the duration, when we calculate this, we take the years times the present value cash flow, divide by the cash flow, and it says it would take about, in average, seven years to redeem the whole cash flow. And the second, what we're calculating is modified duration, which is taking account of volatility, 
taking account of the interest rate, it would take about 6.9592 years to redeem all the coupons and your principal sum. And the formula to calculate the modified duration is, which is duration plus the little symbol right here, is you take duration and you divide by bracket 1 plus y. You divide by bracket 1 plus y, and divide by 1 plus y, 1 is basically, yeah, y is basically its interest rate. So you're kind of dividing by 1.03. That's it. And the third part is when we are given a yield, which is in this case 0 0.03, we're trying to determine the price risk, and we're using this formula right here, and we're going to do it by the following method, that we're going to take modified duration times the P, times the P, which is our present value cash flow, and we'll get $716, which is a price risk when there's a 3% yield. So please know that if yield moves up by 0.1%, the brown price decreases by 0.68%. So that is the example right here. Before we end this lecture today, I want to emphasize a little bit more about the Macaulay duration. That um, some takeaway from that. Firstly, duration decreases with coupon rate, and duration decreases with yield to maturity. Moreover, duration usually increases with maturity as, as well. And for bonds that are selling a PAR or at the premium, duration always increases with maturity. For deep discount bonds, duration can decrease with maturity. And based on experiences, empirically, duration usually increases with maturity. So if the maturity is longer, which means the bond rather than five years, it will be issued over a 10 years period, then it means usually duration will be longer because usually it is quite uh, widely, quite fairly distributed, equally distributed to different years. But if I give you this example right here, that the maturity is long, but the first year I'm going to redeem you 98%, and the next few years, uh, I'm sorry, the first year I'm going to re um, uh, issue you, redeem you 10%, and the next year I'm going to redeem you 1111%, then you will not really follow this principle um, uh, as a consequence. But usually, since it will be widely distributed, like something here, you see it is quite equally distributed, right? 3.5, 3.5, 3.5. So in this case, you will definitely follow, or most bonds actually follow this empirical, uh, empirical statement that duration increases with maturity. Okay. Okay, and lastly, be uh, before we finish this lecture, I'm going to get to you um, and uh, show you guys convexity, which is not only, as I mean, the molecular duration was measuring the sensitivity of a bond, uh, sensitivity of a bond's price to the yield based on how long, the how long is maturity of a bond. The convexity, what is measured is how sensitive, how sensitive itself changes, how the sensitivity of itself actually changes. So convexity um, is based, basically based on second derivative, definitely more complex, but it is based on second derivative. And we're using the second order here, and we're using this thing that you can see here, we have this y1 minus y2, that is actually the linear function of the yield, which actually measures the shifts in interest rate. And the second thing right here you are looking at is actually a quadratic function of the change in the yield that measures the volatility of the interest rate. It may be a bit vague, but just listen back, or let me repeat again. So what you're looking here is actually a linear function of the yield that measures the shifts in interest rate. And the second part is actually a quadratic function of the changes in the yield that measures the volatility of the interest rate. So I'm going to finish my lecture here. For you guys, maybe in the future you can read your textbook. It can be pretty hard to understand, to understand about convexity. So here's an example. You can use Excel to basically calculate this if you input all the elements correctly. Okay, so today we're going to finish right here. So we understand about arbitrage, coupon bonds, and some um, some complex some assumption as well, molecular duration assumption. Okay, so in the next lecture, we're going to go get to corporate bonds and default risk, um, which is our last lecture on fixed income securities by finishing with corporate bonds and the risk, which is actually mainly focused on corporate bonds, actually mainly focused on, I would say, bonds issued by companies. And this, yeah, it is actually, def by definition, corporate bonds means bonds issued by the companies, not by the Federal Reserve System, not by the government, not, not the US T bill, T note, T bond. And lastly, before I finish today, um, the readings emphasize again is 
throughout these three lectures. So we have three lectures in fixed income securities. We have yesterday's lecture, which we talked about pure discount bound and how we value them. And today we've been talking about uh, um, mainly focused on arbitrage and, and discount and coupon bound. And tomorrow I'm going to be discussing about um, fixed income securities, last power wages, corporate bonds, and default risk. And all of those three lectures are going to be based on this reading. So you have the same homework over the lectures, which is to read on uh, Bradley, Miles, and Allen, chapter 23 to 25. So you can take your time to read it over these three different lecture times. Okay, so thank you for watching, thank you for attending, and I'll see you guys in the next lecture. Peace.